Well, I'm Judy Wasserheit, and um, welcome to our members meeting and awards ceremony. I hope all of you have been enjoying the conference. Um, I think this has been a, uh, a pretty interesting and exciting last couple, couple of days, and uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the today and tomorrow. This meeting is the one time each year that we have a chance uh, to talk about CUGH face-to-face -face with as many of the members as, as want to come join us. Um, and so I really appreciate your carving out time to come and talk with me and uh, the other members of the executive committee and the board. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, an update on the transition uh, of board members. Then uh, Tim Brewer, who will be taking over as our new board chair, um, will tell you a little bit about some of the major rec recent accomplishments uh, for CUGH. And he'll highlight emerging plans and priorities, including our 2015 conference in, uh, in Boston. Then Keith will give us uh, a brief financial report. And then we'll have some, some time for uh, some questions and a little bit of discussion. And then we'll move into our award celebration, um, Anvar uh, Velji will present the Velji Awards for Global Health Excellence. Um, <laughs> Richard Horton uh, and Zoe Mullen will present the Lancet CUGH Poster Awards. And then Keith will um, present our CUGH inaugural Global Health Video Competition Awards. So that's the agenda. We have uh, six of our uh, board members who are leaving the board, and I want to thank all of them for uh, their many contributions. Robert Clay, who is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Global Health uh, at USAID, actually is retiring later this summer, so we still have him for a couple more months. Um, but then he will be replaced by his replacement at USAID, um, who is Jennifer Adams. And then we have five other members who are rotating off the board. Afaf Malis, who is Dean of the School of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania, and who actually was one of our co-chairs for last year's conference and who led our advocacy committee, is rotating off. James Orbinski, who's the Chair of Global Health at the University of Toronto. Robin Petzold, who's sitting down there uh, and has been uh, our outstanding treasurer. Uh, she serves as Director of Global Programs at the University of Iowa. Rebecca richards Cordum, who's Professor and Chair of Bioengineering at Rice University, and Jim Tilsch, uh, whom you heard yesterday morning and probably in several of the other sessions, who's chair of global health at George Washington University and who is also the chair of this conference. So uh, many thanks to each of them. Um, we would not be where we are today without them. We have five incoming board members, uh, and they include Peggy Bentley, who is Associate Dean for Global Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Pat Conrad, Associate Dean for Global Health Programs at the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis. Trish Davidson, who I think is somewhere here. Um, good, there she is, uh, is joining us. Um, and she's Dean of uh, Nursing at uh, Johns Hopkins. Nelson C. Combo, whom you heard in our great debate 
Um, and I don't think I'll ever think of passive smoking the same way again um, after listening to Nelson. Um, and Nelson is principal at Makeri University in Uganda and the president of the Ugandan National Academy of Sciences. And Mohamed Zaman, uh, who is associate chair for undergraduate affairs in bioengineering uh, at Boston University. So we have a really distinguished, highly interdisciplinary uh, set of incoming board members. And I also uh, want to point out that uh, for the first time now, we actually have uh, a board member who comes from one of uh, our low and middle income country universities, which is something to which we've aspired for quite a while, and, and I think that's going to make a huge difference. Um, and we are about to have a change in our executive committee at the end of this uh, conference. I will pass the torch to um, Tim Brewer, who is the vice provost for interdisciplinary and cross-campus affairs um, at uh, UCLA and an expert in grizzly bears and Big Macs, as those of you who were here um, yesterday heard. Um, Tim has been fabulous as the vice chair of CUGH, and frankly, over the last two years, I could not have survived without him, and he is our incoming chair. Pierre Buchans, who's dean of uh, the School of Public Health at uh, Tulane, is our incoming vice chair. And Anne Kurth, uh, who is executive director of NYU's College of Nursing Global and associate dean for research at uh, NYU's Global Institute of Public Health, is our incoming secretary treasurer. So I think we are in very good hands. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tim. Um, among the best of hands. Thank you very much. Thanks. So um, whenever I travel for work, I send my son's postcards. Um, and one time I wrote on a postcard, if you bring this card to me within two weeks of when you receive it, I will take you to a Montreal Canadiens hockey game. <laughs> and of course, I knew this was going to cost me nothing. And sure enough, the card sat on the dining room table for two weeks. And after two weeks, I brought it to my son and said, eh, by the way, you might want to read this. <laughs> and he then felt like he still deserved to get to go to the hockey game <laughs> because he did read it when I actually placed it in his hand. And I'm, I'm wondering, Keith, and the relevance to this, which has absolutely nothing to do with grizzly bears, is um, in the announcement for the business meeting, we should put in, if you actually show up for the business meeting, we will give you X, whatever <laughs> X is, box lunch, chocolate. It won't cost us anything, but it will make us feel. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually really grateful that you're, you're all here. So um, to paraphrase Sir Isaac Newton, if CUGH sees farther, it's because it stands on the shoulder of giants. And in global health, there is no one who is taller than Judy Wasserheit. If you have followed her career, uh, not only has she been an outstanding educator and researcher, she is one of the most accomplished builders of critical programs of anyone I have ever seen. So at the National Institutes of Health, she's the founding director of their STI branch. She's later then director of HIV STIs at the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She then goes and directs the HIV vaccine research. She then is up at University of Washington for the first global health department in the country, probably the world. And so everywhere she has gone, she has built incredible institutions and made the world better. Um, and CUJH has also benefited from that. So we have a little 
thank you for Judy Wasser Heist. First of all, the moral of this story is that when you're preparing slides, <laughs> never, ever turn them over to the next person who's going to talk and have him give them to the Speakers Bureau, because you never know what's going to get put into that deck that wasn't there before, right? The second thing is that, uh, you know, I, I really do love um, having a chance to help build new programs that are going to make a real difference, have major impact, especially with super smart, creative, passionate people, and um, both in terms of the board and in terms of the growing membership for CUGH. That's what this has been about. It's been a real privilege, so thank you all. So here's the new board, and I won't take you through all the names other than to say that this is a very exciting, dynamic group of people. I'm really looking forward to the next two years. I'm going to take you through a little bit of some of the things that we hope to, hope to do. Um, so first and foremost, we actually have a new website, and I was coming to the meeting to complain about the website. Um, and lo and behold, while I was on the plane reading the in-flight magazine, they snuck the new website in. And if you haven't had a chance to, to uh, go to it, you really should. It's really got a tremendous amount of capacity, but we're really counting on all of you to help us flesh out the content. But this will be an opportunity for us to share ideas, a way of sharing resources, and I'm really grateful to Keith and the rest of the Secretariat for pulling this together and looking forward to working on that. I want to touch on a few accomplishments just in the past year. We have 15 new members, so we're up to 84 total. Is that right, Keith? 84 universities, uh, so very exciting. A bunch of about 35 international partners, 15 new members. We have a brand new clinical case series that Jerry Passione at Einstein has been developing that is now up on the web. This is opportunities where students or faculty can go read about a case in low resource setting, try to figure out what's going on, and then there's actually instructor notes that go with it. That's just an example of the kind of educational resources that we're hoping to build out. Unfortunately, because I don't know how to schedule things, there is a mentorship program meeting going on right now at this exact same time in one of the other rooms. But what we're really trying to do is create a program where universities that are a little farther ahead in developing their global health program can share their experiences and expertise with those of us who are a little bit, a little bit less along the path of development. And we're quite, quite excited about that. So where else are we trying to think of going? Here are the major standing committees of the organization. We don't spend a lot of time talking about them. But these are really opportunities for all of you to be involved, and I would strongly encourage you to take advantage of them. So if you're interested in communications, how we interact both with you and across and within our universities, the Strategic Communications Committee would be a wonderful place to be. If you like to think about things like core competencies or mentorship, or developing guidelines. Our education committee is really quite active, has a lot of subcommittees as well. We would love your participation. Our research committee is both focusing on an advocacy focus, funding for research, but also trying to think about how we can use research to drive global health forward, both 
global health education, what is it that we need to know about what we're doing to make sure that we're doing our own training correctly, but also global health programs. What is it that we need to know in the field that can help us to do a better job to take care of our patients and to work and improve our own, our own communities. So it, that's a great place where we need people involved. Advocacy is across two, two areas. One is advocacy within universities. Why is this important? Why should universities be thinking about global health? How do we make sure that our provosts and our chancellors and our deans are aware of those kind, kinds of issues? And then advocacy in the broader community, both in our state and our, our national legislatures, but also in general as to what is the value of global health to, to broader society. And then enabling systems are how do we make this all, all work? The University of Washington has this great model that I'm going to screw up, but uh, this is the motto even though it's probably not, is we're the people that do the work that allows the people who are saving the world to save the world, or something like that, right? It's absolutely right. Definitely. See, so, but but you know, this is the logistics. This is all the stuff that you know. As a history major in college, I would fall asleep during when they would talk about. But turns out to be critically important. Like, how do you actually pay someone in a foreign country? Uh, or hire someone, or rent an office, or do all the things that enable us to do, to do our jobs. Very dynamic group of people, and are critically, as I kind of work my way up through the university hierarchy, I have come to learn is a critically important set of, set of functions. So again, another place for you to get involved, and I would encourage you all to do that. So how do you do that? Um, I, you can go to the website, but you can also contact any one of these people. And I, I'll only ask you to remember one email address and phone number. So that's, that's my direct line. That's my email address. Uh, if you ever want to make sure that something needs to be heard about this organization and you don't feel it's being heard, you can always contact me. Just put CUGH in the subject line. Um, do not, please be, do not be upset if I don't get right back to you because I'm not as quick with email as I, I should be. I tend to receive a lot of them, but I promise you that I will get back to you. And so um, if you ever need to contact someone and for some reason you don't feel you're getting a response, please do feel free to get in in touch with me, and I'm glad that all 1,400 people did not show up for the business meeting. <laughs> so um, I think that's, oh, Boston, city I know and love. Uh, our next conference will be there, 2015, from March 26th to 28th. Please put that in your calendars. If you would like to be involved in the, the planning of the program for that, just get in touch with Keith and the Secretariat. We will be creating another program advisory committee similar to that wonderful list of names that you saw on the first day. Critically important for helping us make sure that we develop a program that actually meets your needs. So please, if you would like to be involved, be in touch with us. Tell your friends, neighbors, we desperately need your registration dollars? No, I'm just kidding there. Uh, so, but we do very much want you to, to, to show up. So if you would like to be there, please, please be involved. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Velji is, oh no, Dr. Martin, I'm sorry, who will tell us a little bit about um, whatever he's gonna tell us about. <laughs> Now we know who's interested in business. It's great to see everybody, everybody here. And again, I echo uh, Tim's comments uh, about Judy, and in fact, both of them. No one will know the hours upon hours upon hours they have spent, devoted, volunteered, to support CUGH and all the work that they've done. So let's give them a big round of applause, please. So we worked through doing really essentially three things. We worked through education, research, and service. And our mission, 
which we kind of try to keep reminding ourselves, our goal is to reduce health disparities everywhere. And what we see is the incredible asset that we have out here in terms of you, in terms of your capabilities and your work. And I think when you saw President Obama's comments on our first day, his shout out was not a generic shout out, right? It was a shout out to you. He was saying, I know what you're doing, I respect what you're doing, what you're doing is important, and we want to partner with you. So there are incredible opportunities to do that. And we have, as Tim mentioned, we've grown our membership quite significantly. We had uh, 58 paid members as of December 31st of, uh, of uh, 2013. Uh, we will now have 84 paid members within the next few weeks with another nine coming on. We have 35 low to middle income country members, as Tim mentioned, and that number has grown considerably. We're delighted that Dr. Siwon Combo is now on our board, and we're putting a full court press to be able to increase the number of partners that we have in LMICs. This, of course, is vital to our ability to collaborate, to work together, to learn from each other, so we can again, together, make a difference and, and, and realize that mission. So over the last, uh, last uh, year, we've developed quite a number of partnerships. I won't tell you all of them, but there are an array of consortia that exist in the world right now. We're a founding member of the World Federation for Global Health uh, um, uh, Academic Associations. We develop relationships with the Public Health Institute and USAID. The American Association of Veterinary Colleges. So we brought the vets are now collaborating with us on the One Health, which is extremely exciting. We're working on a partnership with the, Amer uh, the American College of Surgeons, uh, National Institute of Health, CSIS, uh, NCAA, the Global Health Council, the Lancet, which we will not forget, of course, and the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, amongst a whole array of other varied and diverse groups, all of us working in the same direction. So the finances, we moved, as, as some of you know and some of you don't, we moved from uh, California to Washington, D.C. Uh, a year and a half ago and uh, to set up shop here. So in 2013, we had revenues of $360,254. We had costs of $553,000. Our budget for this year is a revenue of $495,388. That's an increase because it actually includes half of the director of operations that uh, we now have a full-time director of operations, which we didn't have last year, and also uh, somebody to help us on our membership and engagement with you. Our uh, total uh, uh, cost will be 668000 and we'll have a deficit uh, this year of, on all things being equal, of 172684 And that's a $20,000 reduction from 2013. That's a deficit. And our goal, my goal, is to eliminate that deficit within two years. And we can do it. And so we're working together to develop and implement a strategic plan that will involve increasing our membership, diversifying our funding stream, and connecting the array of groups that are involved in global health, connecting them to your work, so we'll be able to collectively make the difference we want to. So with that, I will stop, and we will entertain any questions that you may have. So please, if you have a question, please come up to the mic and uh, let us know. Thank you. If not, then we get to go to the fun stuff of playing Santa Claus. But this is a time. <coughs> this is a time if for for us to hear from you. If there are things that uh, you think we can do better, we can do differently, um, or there are things that you think are really great that we should keep doing. Talk to us. It's the only way we're we're going to get better as an organization. We're still very young. We're only five years old. We're still learning and growing. Yeah. Hi, Phil Please. Landrigan, Hi, Phil. Um, Icon School of Medicine in New York. So um, what's the procedure for establishing new committees in addition to the five or six that um, Tim listed a moment ago? And, and specifically what I'm driving at is I think we really ought to have a, a committee that focuses on environmental issues and global health that always tends to be somewhat to the side, and ought to, in my opinion, of course, that's what I do, but um, 
I, I think that environmental factors ought to get more attention. They tend to get overlooked in calculations of global burden of disease because exposure is hard to quantify. And we, we just generally need to have a, I think, a more concerted effort. And one way to do it is to have a committee here within CUGH, which becomes a home for people with those interests. We've, got, we've created uh, two, on our, on, our, on our website, we, two of the interest groups we have, one is explicitly for the environment and health, and the other one we've hived off is in, is in One Health. Because of our relationship with veterinarians and because of the One Health group that they have, what we want to do is focus that attention on, on the One Health initiative. While it is clearly multidisciplinary, we hope, Phil, that those platforms will enable us to attract experts like you and others, and as Tim mentioned, to use that platform, which really has a couple of functions. One, identifying good best practices. Two, identify training modules. Three, there's a, a place for identification of HR needs. Four, there's also uh, forums for discussion. So ultimately, what we want to do is take knowledge over here, build the partnerships, identify the, the needs, intersect the, the funding and the trainers so we can actually take the knowledge we already have and be able to scale it up. So uh, if I could just also respond, what you do is you write an email to Keith Martin and you CC me and you say, we really need to do this. And then it's up to us to get back in touch with you, try and figure out the level of interest and figure out how to move this forward. And I don't know if the right structure is a committee or it's an interest group or quite what it is, but the, the answer is if we're not doing something that anybody in our membership feels we need to be doing, write us and let us know and we'll figure out exactly what the interest level is and what the right, the right response is. Thank you. I sent the email to Keith before lunch hour for you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I didn't respond, Phil. <laughs> Hi, Eric Ting from Harvard School of Public Health. Um, just a side question. Because you're obviously a consortium of universities, first and foremost, what is the general take on partnerships and co-sponsorships of projects with certain industry? Not necessarily pharma, but say, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, these large uh, tech titans that have a lot of interest in global health, obviously, as well, so. So, so um, we actually, our, our strategic communications committee is grappling with this very issue right now. And, and our general feeling is that we're willing to partner with any worthwhile organization that is engaging on improving people's lives. And, how you define worthwhile and engagement are obviously critical details. But I, I think the general concept as an organization is we're very open to partnerships and we're exploring with whom to partner. And what we're in the process of doing is flushing out those policies <coughs> that as we transition to a larger and more active organization are so critical to driving practices. So I, I would suggest getting involved with the Strategic Communications Committee if you're interested in this issue because we could definitely use your, use your help. Dr. Fine. <clears throat> Ollie Fine from uh, Weill Cornell. Uh, two questions. One is uh, how do we actually exist having the size of deficit that, that we have? Uh, and secondly, um, beyond this conference, this excellent conference, uh, what is it that uh, we can say to our universities that this organization is giving them? Um, are there activities that are occurring outside of the annual meeting that we should be aware of? Talk about the activity. Um, I'm on the hot seat again. Okay, so Oliver, um, I think Therefore, I am. Is that correct? Did I get the paraphrase right? So we exist because we actually have some money in the bank. We have about $1.3 million in reserve. But the, that's a way of getting around your question, which is what is the path to financial stability? And, and it is something that our, our 
Finance Committee, which I forgot in realization just now and did not put on the list, is actively grappling with. And what we're trying to do is explore alternate funding models, including um, grants, uh, development and donations, different membership fee structures. But, but you're right, we have to figure that out and we don't, we haven't quite got it just yet. So again, another area where we would benefit from, from people's expertise. But I'm very encouraged by the growth in the membership. I'm very encouraged by the increase in the activities. And I have no doubts that we will not only continue to grow, but we will survive and we will find a financially viable model. In terms of your second question, so again, because of terrible, terrible scheduling, if you were in one of the other rooms, you would be hearing about a mentorship program that we're launching right now that is facilitating the engagement between experienced program health directors and those who have less experience or are having some questions. So that's one program that we're rolling out right now, very real, very concrete, that we can provide experts to come to your university and assist you with the development of your program or to provide you an advice on an informal or as formal basis as you need. A second is a regional workshop that our Enabling Systems Committee ran in February of this year. Again, an opportunity to bring together people from universities to hear about how do you run the business side of, of doing an international operation. So another very concrete thing that we've done, and again, we're trying to, we're trying to build out. On the advocacy side, we have had a couple of times where CUGH has gone up to the hill on behalf of universities. Uh, we have also had meetings, Judy has been involved in meetings in Haile DeVos, both with USAID and other organizations on sort of advocating the role of global health. But again, these are nascent activities. I don't know, Judy, if you want to add, add to that at all. But, but we're, as we go, we're trying to flush out those, those additional critical programs. So two very, very important points to bring up, and thank you very much for, for doing that. So I would, I would just add that, um, Ali, in, in terms of the financing piece, we um, spoke at the board meeting, uh, the board retreat that we had on Friday, about how right now is a pivotal time for us because we're transitioning from being a startup, and startups run deficits, and you know they figure out all their processes and and get things into place into being a sustainable high impact organization and that's exactly the transition we're making right now right um, so I'm okay with these deficits we we have money in the bank as as Tim just said thank goodness we got some nice grants at the beginning um, but we do need to make that transition and and the translation of that is that we really need membership to get involved with the committees and make sure that the package of benefits for members is something that keeps people wanting to be part of this organization and that we get that right. So that's why we really need you all to, to get involved. In addition to some of the things that Tim mentioned, there are also a growing array of educational products that um, can be accessed through the website and through other channels. Um, and we have a research committee uh, that actually was, was uh, instrumental in developing the, the survey uh, that was presented at one of the sessions, but there will be other kinds of things like that. We also need to explore questions of whether we should uh, be affiliated with a journal. Uh, you know, there, there are a whole set of issues, so this is a great time to be involved. I'll take the, Catherine, the last question because then we have the award ceremony. Yeah, Kate Hankins, Amsterdam Institute for Global Health and Development. Two quick questions. Do we have student representation on the board? And if not, why not? And secondly, is the vision actually to become less US centric? And what are we going to do about that? I mean, there are, I've met, I think, eight people from Tanzania here. You know, I've met three or four people from China. I don't see a lot of stuff in the program for them. So, so what? Um, 
this is why I'm asking Judy to return as chair. No, a <laughs> uh, <laughs> cup, couple of things. So um, we, we, we do not have student representation on the board, and that is a, that just was because the majority of the founding directors of the board at the time did not wish that to be. Uh, my personal feeling, but I can't speak for the entire board, is that needs to change. We do have a very active, uh, what we call trainee advisory committee, because not all of our trainees are students. They run a spectrum across uh, different programs. We're in the process, uh, that's brand new, just formed in the past year, and we're in the process of uh, using them to create a mechanism to get trainees on all of our standing committees, because I think we need trainee representation throughout the organization, not just on, on the board. And I am hoping that uh, uh, as the board moves forward and we, we mature that a majority of the board will agree that it, it's critical that we, we have uh, trainee representation on our board. Uh, we are also, as Keith uh, mentioned, very actively trying to expand our international focus. So, so I actually originally joined the board representing McGill, and uh, while I realized that many Americans view Canada as sort of just a colder Boston, it's actually a different country, and, uh, and we started with a North American focus. That has to do with historically how the consortium came about. So Judy referenced the grants. The, the original grant was a Gates-Rockefeller grant, and the original Gates vision was to fund a series of regionally-based consortia, of which the initial one was a North American consortium. Um, that vision eventually got replaced by other priorities in the Gates Foundation, and so after CUGH was launched, those other regional networks did not be developed, were, were not developed. And so some of them are occurring de novo. Judy and I just came from a meeting with a group of delegation from the Chinese Consortium of Universities for Global Health, and we are very actively figuring out how we can partner and support them and, and each other. And as Keith pointed out, we now have one member of our board from a low middle income country. And we have a, been in the process of the past year of revising our membership to move away from that North American focus, which was part of our original founding under the Gates grant, to be a more, a more global, global organization. But part of it is, is historical. And, and please, for those who are from low to middle income countries, please send us your contact information. We want to engage with you. We want to engage with your institutions. We've actually done a really put a lot of effort over the last year, and those numbers are increasing in terms of membership. We need to increase them more. And not only are we the mem uh, founding member of the World Federation, but we are also uh, been working with ALISAG, which is the Latin American Consortia. As was mentioned uh, by Tim, there's the Chinese uh, consortium, uh, and there are other consortia that are developing, and we're trying to work hard with them. But this venue is an extraordinary opportunity for you to engage with us and vice versa. Please send us your contact information. You can get our contact information off our website at cugh.org. So, so, Keith, maybe I, I, I would be willing to stay around after the beaning if there are any additional questions for as long as people need, but to make sure we have enough time for the awards, yeah. um, we'll, we'll move good. on. Yep. We have to, sorry, we'll chat after. Thank you very much. So we'll start with the, uh, the first awards. I think Dr. Belgi is going to uh, introduce your awards. And I want to thank Anbar and his wife for sponsoring these awards year in and year out. If you want to know a little bit about their story, please take a look at it under the description of the awards. And Anbar was one of the founders of GHEC and has been involved in our organization and, and GHEC for more than three decades. Yes. And, and it's taking on a small challenge of starting up a new medical school, just a small project. Thank you very much, Keith. So without uh, much ado, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Keith Martin, Karen Lamb, Shanika Thurman, and the awards committee
for their valuable help and input in reshaping one of the awards, the way it's uh, named, and the requirements for that. And I would also like to thank The Lancet and Dr. Horton in particular for the tremendous support your group has given us since we launched the original Lancet Awards in Sacramento in 2008. So I thank you for that. And thank you, Zoe, and welcome. And uh, I do not want to take away uh, Dr. Horton's uh, part of the surprise he has for you, which we discussed a little earlier on regarding the ex expansion of the Lancet Awards. And uh, moving along, the first award is the Leadership Award for Emerging Leaders in Global Health. And the winner for this year is Joshua L. Greenberg from the University of Michigan Medical School. Joshua is uh, co-founder and chairman and CEO, he's already becoming a businessman there, of Progressive Health Partnership. And uh, not only his organization is a nonprofit here, but also locally registered partner organization in Uganda, the type of models we'd like to see. His focus on local engagement and training in a spectrum of interrelated health issues has indeed created a movement among his colleagues and within the Kiruhara district community in which he serves. I would further encourage you to visit his website of progressivehealth.org for a better understanding of his remarkable approach. One of the accomplishments is the design of field experiments to measure the impact of community health worker home visits to pregnant women and mothers in Uganda, including the design and administration of a baseline survey over 1,200 women. Another is the Omukazi Namagara program to implement the Minister of Health's goal of having four antenatal visits, delivery in a health facility, and three postnatal visits for pregnant women in Kashongi, Kituahara sub-counties. Not only that, he has also devised field experiments to measure the impact of rainwater harvesting intervention in 82 villages in the same region and managing a team of 20 local workers. And these were some of the quotes from Dr. Kolar who nominated Joshua. It is our great honor today to recognize Joshua Greenberg as the 2014 Emerging Leader for 2014. Please come forward. that I didn't mention, he also gets a thousand dollars certificate. <laughs> okay. And congratulations to you and your family. Thank you. We always have to remember the family. That allows things to happen, doesn't it? <laughs> Even on Mother's Day. The second nominations is for the Teaching Excellence in Global Health. And uh, Dr. Roloff is the medical director and a founder of Wukwa Kawok, or the Maya Health Alliance, a nonprofit dedicated to providing high quality medical care in rural indigenous communities in Guatemala. He speaks not only Spanish, but also two indigenous languages. And this is really, truly inspiring. And he has tremendous commitment to establishing programs to provide medical care in the language of the people, which is indeed very rare. Most of us use the uh, interpreters. Over the past 10 years, Dr. Roloff has worked in partnering with community members to develop programs 
to combat child malnutrition, provide high quality evidence-based care of chronic illnesses, such as diabetes, offer routine cervical cancer screening and prenatal care, and help patients with high complex health conditions to access the care they need, such as palliative care, et cetera. Not only is his work impressive, but he also has made mentoring and teaching a priority in his career. One of the goals is to train local health providers, midwives, and community health workers to implement programs, and much of Dr. Roloff's work has involved this type of teaching. He, according to his five students who nominated, nominated him, they are at Harvard, Mayo, and uh, one at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Roloff is incredibly accomplished and a phenomenal mentor offering his students this perfect balance between the independence to grow and the supervision when needed. It is our great pleasure and privilege to present the 2014 Welge Faculty Award for Teaching Excellence in Global Health to Dr. Roloff, and the award will be accepted on his behalf by Anita Cherry. Anita Cherry here. The award for Global Health Project of the Year is an another interesting project. And the nominees of the nominating party was the Microclinic International. Some of you may know about their work. And the nominees were Dr. Eric Ding at the Harvard School of Public Health and Kathleen T. Watson at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. A brief description of the project. <clears throat> Since the diabetes epidemic is emerging as one of the most dangerous and costly global health trend, especially in the Middle East and North African countries, some of the highest diabetes prevalence in the world is indeed there and growing rapidly throughout the world. Over the past year, and in partnership with Queen Rania of Jordan, the Ministry of Health and Microclinic International launched new cycles of its chronic disease prevention program in Jordan, where nearly two-thirds of the population is overweight or obese, and 11.6% suffer from diabetes. Targeting socioeconomically disadvantaged communities with limited or no access to health care has indeed uh, penetrated to the poor neighborhoods in Greater Amman, Ayn al-Basha, and Jabal al-Nasser. MCI is nominating Dr. Eric Deng, a research scientist from the Harvard School of Public Health, and Kathleen Watson, a graduate student from Columbia, for their leading roles in the social network research group that pioneered a randomized control trial on the microclinic model. Building on the additional analysis of data from Jordan, Dr. Eric Dung and Kathleen Watson are conducting further clinical studies in several other areas. In addition Dr. Jordan, to uh, the Jordan project, the microclinic model has also been implemented in the West Bank and in Kenya, in the Appalachia in Kentucky, and in India. It is our way of expressing our deepest deepest gratitude and admiration to this project. Please come forward.
And this is also for <clears throat> Kathleen Watson, who could not be here today, but being accepted by Dr. David. Thank you very much. <clears throat> With this, we will move forward to the Lancet Awards. Dr. Richard Horton. Thank you so much, and um, I'm going to, uh, it's really a huge pleasure and privilege to uh, be here with my colleague Zoe uh, Marlon, who's the editor of Lancet Global. Come on, Zoe, come on, come on up too. Um, and uh, we're going to take all of our uh, poster award winners in one group. Um, so let me read the names out, and please come up here as soon <coughs> as your name is read out, and we'll get a great photograph. Uh, Raquel Kohler, uh, Caitlin Hall, Gabrielle... Prager, Zachary Warner, Adam Schwartz, Michelle Mergler, and Emily Hedrick. Please come up here and give them a big round of applause. And I just want to say the great thing about this meeting are the young people who are presenting fantastic research. And this is why, for me, this meeting is the meeting that I need to go to every year from now on. And Zoe and I will definitely be here every year. It's a fantastic job. Well done to all of you. Well done uh, for all of you who've come this lunchtime to celebrate this success. <laughs> So two other awards we have uh, right now. Um, we did a first this year. We we're going to compete with the Sundance Film Festival. So we've created our first Global Health Film Festival. So please come out tonight and watch it from 6.30 to 7.30. But we also created a Global Health video competition. And we have the winners. So if you are winners, and I name you and you're here, please come up and we'll take a picture of you here if you can. So the winners of our first video competition awards are Nicole Rappin for One in Six, Catherine Streifel for Global Trends Towards Universal Health Coverage, Corinne Ertz for The Heart of Pook, Heather Calvert for the Botswana UPenn Partnership Telemedicine and Health Informatics Program, and Kushal Patel, I Got Disruptive Innovations, The Cutting Edge of the Practical. So if anybody's here who is one of those names, please come on up here. Great. And please come up and watch these videos because these are short five-minute videos. They're designed to showcase innovation and spread the good word about incredible things that are happening. So, well, that's great. And last but definitely not least, we have a Trainee Essay Awards. And this has been going on for a little bit of time. So the award winners, if you are a winner, again, please come on up. The award winners for the 2014 Trainee Essay Award are Melissa McCoy, Shiam Gelong, and honorable mentions go to Nozle Abedini, Rebecca Cook, Gilbert Lamb, Tracy Zander, and Lisa Simon. So if anybody's here, come on up. Oh, you are. Fantastic. Come on up.
National Telescope Ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So that's it for the awards, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Now we have an absolutely amazing plenary panel coming up. So stick in your seats and enjoy. And a big thanks to our panel and platform folks here.